Okay, so uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you uh, had a quick lunch and our, you are, your energies are uh, refilled. So uh, welcome, Vitali. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, Absolutely. Vitali works at JetBrains as an educator, being responsible for JetBrains educational initiatives at the St. Petersburg State University in Russia. He taught Haskell at the university level for a decade and he's the author of Haskell in Depth. He's also a member of the GAC Steering Committee. Clearly, Vitaly knows a lot and has a lot to share about Haskell and how to make the language even better. And today he will talk about the clear path to Haskell complexities and how everyone can master Haskell to be effective and productive. So please welcome Vitaly. Okay, thank you. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so, so, uh, Armando told several words about me, so I do work at JetBrains and I'm not a programmer there, uh, I'm responsible for education and uh, I also work at the university, so I'm an educator and you know this is uh, uh, very important uh, to say because uh, I teach programming mostly, programming in Haskell, programming in other programming languages and uh, I see I look at Haskell as a tool to educate some other people. So this is my problem. This is what I'm trying to solve uh, all the time. Uh, I will talk about three problems in this talk. And the first problem is, uh, just, it's, it's a complaint that I heard like millions of times. So people very often tell me, well, I don't understand monads. So this is our first problem and I want to teach you how to answer this question. Or maybe if you have this problem yourself, maybe I'll explain you that uh, this is not the real problem. Okay, let's, let's get to that. Uh, first, there is no such thing as understanding monads because there is nothing uh, to understand. There is no deep, meaning. So what do we have instead? Instead we have a definition and in Haskell definition is just a type class and several laws and laws are important but not that important as types here. Okay so we have a definition like a couple of methods and that's it. Uh, we also have examples, and these examples in Haskell, they are actually instances. So if we have maybe monad, it's an instance of maybe of a monad um, for one particular type. So these are examples. And then we also have examples of using those instances. Look, we have two sorts of examples here. Uh, particular instance itself is already an example of a monad. And using those instances, like instance for maybe, is another sort of examples. And this is it all. There is nothing more than that. And we can compare it with mathematics. Like in mathematics, we always have definition of something, and then we look at examples. Some of examples can be motivational, uh, some of examples can uh, exp explain things, but that's it. There is no metaphors. There is no these sort of explanations. What's the problem with metaphors, the usual problem with mono tutorials? Uh, the problem is that those metaphors, they almost never refer to monads itself. They explain you examples. And while some metaphors can be good for one or several examples, they can be totally misleading for many other examples. Like if you know a metaphor of a monad as a container, then it will be absolutely useless for you if you want to learn something about continuation monad. Okay, so we don't need this, another additional thing here. So we have definition, we have examples, and that's it. We don't need anything else. So that's why uh, there is no, that's why I say that there is no this understanding monad problem, because there is nothing to understand there. Um, 
And that's why my first advice here, so I uh, want to give several advices, several pieces of advice in this talk. So we should prefer types to examples. Uh, so types is the only important thing in Haskell, actually. So if we look at type class, we see methods, we see their types, and that should be enough in most cases. So we look at types first, and then we look at examples, but we prefer those examples to metaphors. And look, here is a problem for those who want to learn about monads in other, maybe untyped programming languages. For example, a week ago, there was a big scandal in JavaScript community, then some of them were trying to explain monads to others, and then several Haskell, Haskellers tried to explain monads in their own way. And it was a complete disaster because in JavaScript, they don't have this idea of type. So they have only examples. And then they try to use those metaphors just as we used like dozens of years ago. Uh, and it, it was a problem because, well, different languages, uh, different ideas. But still in Haskell, we prefer types. So this is the main thing to study any abstraction actually. So any abstraction is Haskell is described by types. So we look at types, we read them carefully, and that's it. We don't need anything else. So types, well, maybe examples, that's it. And I also want to talk about the root of this problem, the root of the problem of understanding monads. So in fact, it's not about, uh, I don't understand. It's about uh, feeling that there is something deep behind those monads. And in fact, in Haskell, there is nothing that deep. We have only types and that's it. So again, that's the usual situation in mathematics. If we start learning some part of mathematics, for example, category theory, there is no deep understanding. We have just definitions and examples, and then another definitions and other examples. And we also have usage there, uh, like in the form of theorems, uh, and that's it. Nothing deep. And the problem here is that we expect something deep. We think that there is something, but there is nothing. So, and this is a problem, of course, if you expect something deep and you don't see it immediately, then it's a problem for you. But the idea is that there is nothing like that. So uh, when I'm explaining monads to uh, my students, I always uh, try to give them uh, this feeling that there is no something, there is nothing there uh, behind this stuff. We have types, that's enough for Haskell. And uh, another point here is, uh, that we uh, don't need that stuff. We don't need that deep stuff because in most of cases, uh, we are the users of the library. So we are users of monads and it's enough to know the types, methods, and, and we don't need anything else. All right, it was a simple problem actually. Uh, we always talk about monads uh, in the very beginning when learning Haskell is the first time. So, uh, I wish all of you uh, uh, never trying to understand monads. All right, second problem here is that there are many abstractions. It's not the only monads uh, which bother Haskell users. So for example, here at, in this slide, I tried to list some of them. Of course, we adore them, we are very fond of of ours, if we just if we were able to use some uh, co monad or free monad or uh, pro functors, whatever. So we like those abstractions. But let's uh, think about software development. So these are all good stuff. They come from mathematics. They have solid bases, just fine. Uh, but if we are developing libraries, like most of programmers develop some libraries. Uh, we have a problem we are trying to solve. We write some implementation 
And of course, we think about interface to those library, to, those, uh, to the solution that we are trying to give to our users. And as usual in programming, we want to have a wall between implementation and interface. Uh, why do we need that? Well, because it's, it's, it's traditional software engineering thing. So we want to be able to change implementation if we want to, to make it faster. Um, and we want also to make it simpler to the user to use uh, this interface. So the user don't have to think about a lot of implementation details. We give it him or her an interface and that's, that's all right. Uh, but note, that interface is also an abstraction. So whenever we provide some interface to a library, uh, we give some sort of abstraction. But this is a special abstraction. It's usually uh, connected to the problem. So it's an abstraction for, from the problem domain. And if a user have, has some problem, then he or she knows that, uh, uh, in, with this problem, there are these sorts of abstractions. So it's not a problem. It's not a general abstraction as core monads, three monads, and others. So interface is still an abstraction. All right, but these are uh, traditional programming libraries development. But what about Haskell? In Haskell situation is different because in most cases, we have also an abstraction, a general abstraction, which we use in our libraries. And here we have two options. The first option, when abstraction works in the implementation and in the interface. And the second option is when abstraction is used for implementation only things. And we don't want to try to introduce those abstractions into interface. So these are just two approaches. I'm not saying that this is the right approach, this is wrong approach, no. But uh, these are two approaches to develop Haskell libraries. We always have those abstractions. At least we almost always have monads, by the way. Uh, but sometimes we bring those uh, uh, abstractions to the interface. Sometimes we keep uh, them only to the implementation. Uh, if we take the first approach, then we have to uh, uh, some problems which uh, is about what we expect from our users. So here I try to uh, emphasize things which we expect from our users. If we bring an abstraction to the interface, then we expect that the user understands this particular abstraction. So interface is abstraction. And then we also have this general abstraction. Uh, if we use abstraction only for implementation, then we expect from the user to know only interface and that's it. So this is the main difference with these two approaches. And of course, if we expect from the user that, uh, from users, users that they should know all this stuff, then of course, the user is able to see all those abstractions in error messages, for example. They, they should write these abstract things in their own code. So that's it. If we take the first approach, then it is often the case that we have something like that. So we develop a library and we expect from the user the knowledge of plenty of abstractions, plenty of interfaces. And this is uh, the main source of the complexity for many, many Haskell uh, libraries. So it just, um, it's hard because we expect knowledge of many abstractions of many interfaces. Um, example. My first example is about making groups. So first, of course, we can make groups of lists. These two functions from base, very simple. We have a list of elements and we want to uh, group equal elements to each other. 
So we have list as an argument, we have a list of lists as a result. Base provides uh, us with uh, several examples of these grouping functions, like the another one is for text. And when we have a text, text is also an abstraction, of course, but here we hide the uh, equality. There is no eek type class anymore because uh, it is hidden somehow inside the definition of text data type. But that's, that's an example. Very simple function and every beginning Haskell programmer uh, knows everything about this function. All right. Now let's look at some sophisticated library. Streaming library. Streaming is a, a tool, is an instrument in Haskell which allows to do something which look like least processing but in constant memory without too much laziness so it's uh, it is used for efficient implementations and that's it. so streaming uh, when we look at the type of the group function in the streaming library then we see very close things we have also eek a we have a constraint for equality we have a stream of a instead of list of a uh, in streaming, they have also monads. They have R as a type of result. So uh, just try to see the, the, the same things and don't think uh, much about uh, differences. So we have stream of A as an uh, argument, and we have stream. And this, this first argument to the stream, stream of A. So this is how they uh, express. Uh, group of streams in the streaming library. So the offer of this library introduces one new abstraction stream, which is the main specific abstraction. And this is how it is possible to express a, a group of streams. All right, but now let's look at another library pipes group library. So library from the ecosystem of pipes. Another streaming mature ecosystem, uh, very powerful, uh, very efficient, very good. So the same function, it is now a lens. What the hell is lens? It's a very difficult thing. Well, maybe it's not difficult, but if you're a beginning programmer, it's definitely, uh, uh a problem to read such type of course i heard to the uh, brilliant talk of pavel schultz this morning uh he was very great ex great ex at explaining lenses but still uh you have to grasp all these concepts this uh, this concept this abstraction of lens to be able to read this type all right then you have producers well, it's very something very close to um, uh, stream in the previous library. So we produce elements, but why A and A prime? We have four types here. And then we also, we have three monads in this type. So it's another abstraction, which is brought to this type. All right, if you know three monads, then you maybe know that this is a de facto standard way to express tree-like, least-like structures over uh, functorial abstractions. So it's not a problem to have three monads. But when we look at this definition, at this type, we should learn about lenses, we should learn about three monads, and then we should also learn about library interface, like this producer type. So this is my first example. Some libraries hide interface, hide abstractions behind that interface, but other libraries just invite you to learn everything in Haskell before you can uh, efficiently use this library. Second example, as we are talking about lenses, uh, we have a couple of libraries. Lens library is, uh, quite old, about 10 years ago, to, to maybe six, seven, something like that. And Optics is a very new library from WellType, um, which was released, I think, less than a year ago. Uh, and here, what they are doing in those libraries, 
Lens library uses the first approach when everything is open to the user, when you have to know all the abstractions, you have to remember about your know, dilemma, otherwise it's just very difficult to understand. And then there is this optics library when everything is uh, hidden behind this wall. Of course, they have ISO, they have lens, they have uh, the same sorts of optics there in that library, but they hide implementation details. They call it uh, opaque interface, and they find it very easy to learn optics because you don't need to know all that stuff. Of course, authors of this library know that stuff pretty well. Otherwise, it would be impossible to write such a library. But its user, its user can know nothing about profunctor optics that they use uh, behind this abstraction. So that's an example. And again, I have a disclaimer. It's not about good design or bad design. We have different des designs in, in Haskell. All of them are good. I'm talking just about consequences for education. When you want to learn something, then you have to build a path to this library. Of course, you can become a user of lenses without understanding its implementation. But you can face very difficult error messages in that case and then you will have tough time to try to figure out what is wrong with your code. Uh, another piece of advice. So if you want to use a library, well, then think as a user. Like we all use electricity and we don't have to know anything about electrons and how all this stuff works. We just have a socket and then we uh, just switch off switch on our device and then we use it. So we are users and it's the same approach with the libraries. So first try to use them. Don't think about implementation at all. And if you feel adventurous enough, then go and look for abstractions that they use in that library. And when you learn those abstractions, please start with the most general ones. Most general, they are very simple. If you look at the definition of the category in Haskell, you will see that it's, it is very, very small. It's just type and a couple of lures and nothing else. And again, if you remember what I told you in the, first, in the discussion of the first problem, that should be enough. Look at the definition of category. Look at the definition of end of functor. Look at the definition of anything else. And you will see the types. That's enough. You don't need uh, other stuff here to understand uh, what is going on there. So uh, that's, that's my piece of advice. Start with the most general ones. And then it will be easy. And in fact, there are like, a dozen of them, maybe a couple of dozens. But if you try to go backwards, well, it's difficult to learn something about uh, profunctors if you don't understand the basic notion of category. But again, oh, I, I'm using this word understand, but again, there is nothing to understand. You just learn the definition, look at the types, look at a couple of examples, and that's enough. Uh, all right. Uh, so there is also a root to this problem. And the root is in math. In mathematics, we don't have such tools to distinguish interface and implementation. Well, it's not a problem in mathematics because uh, we have much more programmers than math mathematicians, actually. And if we use mathematical abstractions, we try to express them in Haskell just as they are in mathematics. And that means without any border between interface and implementation. So that's why if you look at the dependencies of the lens library, you will see all, all that stuff in con extensions uh, and everything else. So it's how mathematics works without this distinguishing interface and implementation. 
So those tools were invented specifically in programming. And my idea is that uh, it's a good idea to use this tool, which is absent in mathematics, if you work in programming. But of, but of course, you can uh, write libraries without that, uh, that border between one and another. But it's still, we have a problem because it's like that in mathematics. So it's inherited in some sense. All right. Uh, and I also have a third problem, which is reading. Uh, I think Haskell is uh, like uh, reading very much. We have so many um, blog posts. We have uh, Reddit discussions, huge Reddit discussions. We have a lot of discussions on tweets and uh, other social networks. We have books uh, and we always read. So why it is a problem? I have a couple of points here. So first, we should read documentation. And it's a good idea to read documentation from top to bottom. And one best example of documentation that uh, not many people read, but it actually deserves it very well, uh, is a control exception module. Control exception module in base uh, features brilliant documentation with an explanation of design decisions, with uh, good and bad practices, with uh, advice on how to use uh, functions from that library. It just literally saying, if you have this problem, please use this function. If you have that problem, please use, use that one. And then you also, when you read documentation from top to bottom, you can see the general picture. Like usually we have uh, this way of uh, doing things. Like we have a problem, some particular small problem, and we try to find function. And then we read about this function and we never read doc from top to bottom. And as a result, we don't know how to use this function properly. So please read documentation from top to bottom. Most of uh, Haskell libraries, or, or I should say good Haskell libraries, they feature good uh, documentation. And if we read it from the beginning to the end, then we'll be fine even without tutorials and other stuff like that. Uh, and my more important advice here is that you should always, 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 I'm sorry for repeating it, write your own code, even if you're just beginning learning some stuff in Haskell. Like many libraries give you examples in uh, GHCI. Repeat them, change the examples a little bit. Try to invent new problems which are similar to the problems in those blog posts and the documentation in books. So this is the only way to learn programming in, in any programming language. So you read and at the same time you write. So that's the main solution to any programming problem. If you learn something, you try to write your own code solve your own problems or maybe small modifications of the problems from the book and then you are on the safe side and of course there is a route here either it's easier to read we think that if we read dozens of blog posts about lenses then we are good to go no we will be good to go only if we do exercises if we write actual code and if we do something. So doing always works better than reading. So that's my point. And that's my way, which I use in my book and which uh, I use with my students. So I think it's a good way to tackle any Haskell complexity. So thank you. I think that's my, that my time is over.